Community Mental Health Authority. Uh, we're located in southeast Michigan, near in Adrian, just north of Toledo. We're rather a small city of age. Uh, I am on the board there. I used to be a consumer, too, beforehand. Uh, we're going to talk about some of my life experiences and how that led us to create the E-Race Stigma 5K, which we just had our second uh, race just this past May. Uh, I have done over 200 multi-sport events in the past 20 years. 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, 8 marathons. Uh, I did an Ironman in 2014. For those who don't know, an Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, followed by 112 mile bike, and then a 26.2 mile run. For comparison's sake, one percent of Americans have done an iron, done a marathon, while one ten thousandth have done an Ironman. So, these are some of my race bibs I have. I keep most of them. They each have like a memory or some purpose. Plus, they I look at them all now. I see like all the money I spent too because it's expensive. <laughs> uh, you might think. You couldn't do these events, or you're not in shape, or uh, you're not a runner, or you haven't got the motivation or energy, or you're just too busy with life and your family. Uh, this was me 20 years ago. I weighed 250 pounds. And this is me now from uh, like a month ago. I did a half Ironman in Grand Rapids. There's been ups and downs too. I've been diagnosed bipolar and hospitalized twice. Uh, but only after getting, getting services from CMH and helping my family was I actually able to do the Ironman. I could do running and other things, but to, to tackle what the Ironman is, I could not have done that before. So basically 20 years ago I thought, I was 250 pounds, I wanted to change my life. I was not happy, I was, I look at that photo and I think how depressed I really was. Um, I was very paranoid, I had running thoughts. Uh, I, my girlfriend asked me like, what does that mean, be paranoid? I remember I was in the hospital, I was talking to a doctor and he's asking me like, uh, so what are you thinking right now? I said, well, I'm thinking what you're thinking of me. I'm always looking at situations trying to see what the other person's thinking. My mind's always churning at a very high level. And that's probably a good way to talk about that. Um, I remember I started running, I was so embarrassed by how I looked that I only ran at night. And I only did one mile loops in our neighborhood. And I would fall and trip. and I couldn't talk to my parents about it because I was so embarrassed by running. But I thought if I ran, that was the one thing that most bang for your buck. Uh, but I didn't give up, and I had some friends who helped me out, and eventually running clicked. Uh, running for me at the time was, people have the runners high, but I got high. I was cloud nine. I would pump my fist, I would challenge traffic. I didn't care if the car was coming. I just wanted to beat that car across the road. And th at the time, this didn't really phase me. It's like, whatever. This is no problem. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess depression could be this endless cycle where you're always thinking negative thoughts and going down. But essentially I created a positive one by running and biking. By training and running I thought, well, I don't want to have a Big Mac after my run. I want to have something healthy. So I stopped eating fast food. I also stopped drinking cola and pop. So my whole lifestyle changed. I think, I know a lot of people, they want to change their, they want to lose 20 pounds, but I always tell them, you don't lose 20 pounds, you want to change your life. It's two different things. It's, you might lose those 20 pounds, but then you'll gain it back. You want to change your whole lifestyle. So within a year, I dropped 100 pounds, and I've kept it off for almost 20 years now. After a year of running, I decided I want to do a marathon. The Detroit Marathon has a slogan that says, any marathon, a marathon is extraordinary achievement by an ordinary person. I remember at the time I thought I was 
rather ordinary, but I wanted to do something I couldn't think about doing, like a marathon. It's like 26 miles. I, said, I can do this. So what I did was I used the Respective Marathon program, and I'm pretty goal-oriented, and this is the program I use, but the key thing you think about is you don't think about doing the 26 miles. It seems too much right now, but if you do day by day, week by week, eventually you'll get to the 26.2. You don't think about doing the 26.2 today, but just what you have to do that each day. I always tell people in mental health, it's like, don't focus on the future, focus on the here and now. Um, when I did the marathon, they have a green bits, people for the first time, and so everybody knows who you are, and they clap and scream and yell at you. It's, it's just really rewarding. And I did the marathon in under four hours without walking. Um, that's my sister. We do uh, the turkey trot together every year in Detroit. And after I did the marathon, she started running too. And she did the marathon herself. And so we're doing the turkey trot like the 15th year in a row this November in a few weeks. So it's something we do together. While I was accessory my physical health around, my mental health was another story. I was still getting very high, which I loved. <laughs> and people look at you and think, well, you're really fit, you look really confident, you're strong, but they don't see what's going inside with my mind. I was at Western Michigan at the time, and when I was having sporadic injuries, and I was worried about my future, uh, I was playing very inward and paranoid, uh, I was getting lost in my thoughts. Uh, I didn't clean my room, I wore dirty clothes, I would urinate in bottles, I couldn't talk to anybody. And these were daily thoughts. I remember our window, and if you're dormitory, you see the windows have grates. And you think, well, if I take a screwdriver, I can unscrew those grates, and I can jump out. And I didn't think, well, I would never do that. But, I mean, if you're that far gone, it only takes that one, one mistake, and then your life is over. You don't think about that, but when you're that lost in your tunnel, so I opened up my sister, and she uh, we went to the hospital. I just thought we talked to somebody. Well, the next thing I know, we're being bused to uh, the psych ward in Tecumseh. And I remember we're going in and we're getting uh, evaluated with my sister. And I said, well, we'll just, we're putting you in the psych ward. Just relax and take your time. And I remember they take me down to the art room they have. And, uh, there's like 10 of us in there. They're going around the room introducing people. And they get to me, and they say, well, hi, what's your name? I said, my name's Greg. And they say, why are you here? And I thought, well, they know why I'm here, but I don't want to say it. And they kept on asking me questions, and then I started crying, and I just lost it. I mean, the next day, I was getting pills out of a Dixie cup, psychotic, uh, antidepressant, a stabilizer, that's, uh, it's, that's hitting rock bottom. I remember when we did art room, we did art work, art room, I painted that uh, little character right there. I remember I painted red and orange because I wanted to go home, because it, it seemed like a very warm and colorful drawing that I thought, that's where I want to be, I don't want to be here. Every day I was in the hospital, uh, my sister came and visited me. She works in Detroit, so she drove 90 minutes down there to see me. She uh, brought me food, because I didn't have the cafeteria food. She asked to call me ahead, what do you want to eat? She brought it home, and, and then she'd leave, and they came back the next day. She did that for the whole week I was there. On a funny note, is I asked them, I need to work out in the hospital. I need to run. I need to do something. I'm just like chomping at the bit. So I asked them, do you have a workout room? And they said, well, yes we do, but it used to be the smoking room. So you think about that. Who would you rather have a smoking room or a workout room in a psych ward? I was like, and they said, well, no one uses it. And I just like just shake my head. So every day I ran that treadmill. Even when I got out of the hospital, the world's upside down. I was taking multiple strong medications, seeing a psychiatrist. I was going through therapy. Uh, everything was through CMH. 
I was doing dialectic behavioral therapy, which is basically therapy plus a classroom setting. I was hospitalized again. Uh, I remember going in the second time, it's around Halloween. And I go in, and in the lobby where they're watching television, it was during Halloween, and the AMC was on, and they're watching a horror movie week. So all week, we were watching horror movies in the psych ward. <laughs> and I was, this just seems to wrong to me. <laughs> and everybody was glued to it. We don't want to want to change the channel. So we're watching like Friday, Friday the 13th. Ah, it was just surreal. <laughs> I remember when I got out, I had friends, and how do you tell your friends you're in the hospital? They, they think you're in college. Well, I saw one friend at the grocery store, and I basically said, well, I'm just here for the weekend. And I lied. Eventually, I, I talked to them, and another friend was renovating a house to move into. And uh, he asked me if it was OK if I had a hammer in my hand. So he was just this is an innocent comment because he cared, but it just it's a lot to deal with. Throughout this whole period, exercise for me was kept me balanced. Every day I would do a workout, I'd run, bike. It gave me a purpose, something that got me outside, I got energy, serotonin. I accomplished something. I was working on something. Uh, the medications, they took away my highs, but uh, I was still doing okay. I was also vulnerable downturns, so though. I would, I might miss a workout, and then I might miss another, another. Then I get negative thought patterns, thinking, well, I lost my fitness, or I'm not going to be fast as it was before. It's going to be hard to go outside. My coach would call me. The negative pattern is swirled again. Having support systems in place would really help me out. I had a strong family and CMH. I remember during one tough spell, a nurse at CMH called me at home because she had heard that I was not doing well. We had someone that invested to call you at your home to check up on how you're doing. That, that meant a lot to me. Um, I think it didn't take a month or several months or a year. It took several years to turn around. I think it was like an Iron Man. It's like you just do it day by day, week by week, just slowly working getting better. Uh, for me, what's important is routine. Uh, I take my meds at the same time every day. I'm in bed nearly like 10 o'clock every night, same on the weekends. Uh, I need consistency, but I also try not to get caught up in that too. I want to make sure I'm always challenging myself. So I see a lot of people about all this, they, they don't challenge them, so they say, I can't. I want to say, well, you can. During my recovery, I never thought about doing Ironman. I was just doing shorter races. The turning point for me was I was doing a sprint marathon and I got hurt. Instead of coming lost, I decided, well, I'm going to bike more. So I embraced the bike. I was biking. Went from bike like 20 miles a week to over 100. I did a century ride, which is 100 miles. And I thought, well, I'm going to do a half a full aquacon, which is basically an Ironman minus the running. And that's a picture of my bike there. Uh, so over the spring summer, I trained for that aquathon. And in the fall, I completed it with ease. That's a photo. It was outside of Cedar Point. It's a in the water. I then thought, well, I did that, I'm going to do an Ironman. So I began training in earnest in 2013. And it, this really hammers home about how current and how in the moment you have to be. During my biggest week, I was training 22 hours. I was working full time. Then you add on travel time for weekend trips to a uh, place to swim or a destination to bike. It's over 30 hours. But most weeks, I was training 12 and 18. What I really noticed was that as my mental health improved, my ability to do things physically improved too, like the Ironman. And I've done uh, 5Ks that since the Ironman, I actually, I actually won some races, which I never thought I could win a race. It's, it's pretty incredible that what I've been able to do since I've gotten better. 
and those are some photos of Iron Man. I remember during my training for the Iron Man, I uh, pulled a leg muscle like a month out. And I remember thinking, what's, what, what's going to happen? I was worried that all this time invested, I was not going to be able to do it. Well, I just biked more. So then after I recovered, I said, well, I think it was my second run, I pulled my other calf, and I was like three weeks out the Ironman, and I was walking home, I was crying, because you invested so much for this one day, it's likely one day, and I recovered and I did the Ironman. I hope I conveyed that you're always trying to push yourself and you want to demand more. I always get people asking me, well, how did you get started? I mean, just, you just, I just wanted more of my life. I wanted to do something special. I wanted to push myself. I didn't also want my illness to define who I am. I take medications, but I don't really think of them as medications. I just take them as vitamins in the morning. I don't really try to focus on that. So I'm always trying to push myself farther. I could not be here today two years ago or or even a year ago, I couldn't be here today. So I decided to use my Ironman experience as springboard. Um, to be more involved in the community, because I always wanted to do something like this to help people or be involved and inspire people with mental illness. I remember uh, walking to CMH, I saw a nurse that I knew, and I was kind of embarrassed that, well, I did an Iron Man, can this help people? And I was, was like, no, probably can't, but maybe. And she just smiled at me and said, yes, yeah, so we can do something. And I had no idea what was going to happen after that. I was, it's, it's been a whirlwind. So CMH asked me to write art for a newsletter, which that was easy enough. To talk about my race and my weight loss and my recovery. And then they asked me to speak at the drop in center about health and wellness. I thought, well, that's probably just because everyone wants to be healthy, everyone wants to hear a success story. <clears throat> then I learned that people with mental illness, they live significantly less longer than those without. And then it really clicked why they wanted me to talk. Um, I've learned people with mental illness, they have higher rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and respiratory. Also, the rates of mortality for these diseases for SMI populations are several times that of the general population. There are a number of factors place people with SMI at higher risks, mostly alcohol, smoking, poor nutrition, lack of exercise. Many clinicians and patients believe that exercise is an effective strategy to manage negative moods. Depressive symptoms are the most common debilitating symptoms experienced by bipolar patients. So at an individual level, I saw myself as a case study in this. I had lost a lot of weight. I saw how much fitness has helped me, how much my chemicals have balanced out. So I can see maybe I can do something to help out. After speaking to the drop in and learning about the health risks, many of which are associated with obesity, I knew I could do more. For this moment population, obesity rates are nearly twice that of the overall population. The physical inactivity and healthy diet is commonplace. So I thought, let's start a walking club, the drop in. So once a week, we have about five to 10 people to walk. And we've been walking for over two years now. Many people, it was hard to get them to walk, but once they actually got outside walking, you could see their mood change, they became more happy, they accomplished something. Plus, when you walk, I mean, I, I run, I do other things, but those are more expensive. Like, you walk, all you need to do is just walk out the door. <laughs> people say no all the time, but how can you say no to walking? I ran to a friend who does walk, who walked with us downtown not long ago, and he had lost about 40 pounds. He walks intermittently with us, and uh, he was just beaming because he's saying like everything he said was true, Greg. About you know if you just take that step or just improve upon yourself, you really do feel better. This is it's really hard 
get people to get started. That's the, I find the hard thing is to get people to get started. So after that, I was asked to give a speech at the CMH Wellness Conference about my experiences. That's a bad paper. They wanted me to talk for 90 minutes. I was like, no, I can't do that. No. <laughs> no, no, no. They asked me originally at first when CMH said, well, no. Then they came back to me and asked again. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to be true to who I am and push myself, I got to say yes. So if I say yes, then I'll have time to prepare. So I basically kick that can out of the room too a little bit. So, I gave a speech, it was well received, then not long after that, someone asked me at the board of CMH, and I think, well, why would they want me on the board? I didn't know what I would bring to the board. I thought board was more about people who were executives or politicians, people with more power than me. And I remember we were on the board for like a couple months, and I thought, well, what am I going to offer the board? What can I do? Because I need to do something. I don't like to sit still. So I thought, well, maybe we do a 5K and kind of bring what we did with the walking club to, to a bigger level and spread the connection between health and fitness. I want to give people the joy of exercise, sense of accomplishment, finishing an event with peers, and <coughs> uh, providing support in an open and welcoming environment. I gave a two-page proposal, and they said yes. Uh, I also wanted to make it a family event. We had a kid's dad go out and reach out to children in the community that received services from CMH. So it was roughly, roughly a mile, and it was before the race. And the board granted me $3,500 to do the event. I was, uh, I was shocked they said yes. I've been the board for two months, and they gave me the keys to the car <laughs> to do an event. I was like, I don't think they really knew what's going on, but I knew, <laughs> I knew but they didn't know. <laughs> they really did. So if you look at that photo, that's the photo of our bags we had during registration. Each bag had uh, a bib in it, a shirt, paper clips. So I could talk about all these little details. Our shirt design, we had hats. Uh, making a logo, flyers, all, there's a ton of things I could talk about. But there's three things that were important to me that we set out from the beginning. I want to reach out to people with SMI members and get them involved in a race, like at the walking club. I also want to partner with like-minded organizations who we build better relationships with or develop new ones. I also want to reach out to the public through various media platforms to promote the race and have an open discussion about mental health. <clears throat> I felt with hard work and dedication, plus utilizing my own contacts, and experience with the consumer as a member of the local community, we can make an event successful. I thought it was important for us to be very inclusive, so we reached out to the Drop-In Center, Goodwill, and Hope Center, which services those with disabilities in our community. I talked to their members, I talked to their leadership, and they got on board. In our first year, the drop in had 10 members at our race, plus another 15 that volunteered at our water station. We had 20 from Hope, I'm sorry, uh, 20 from Goodwill, and 10 from Hope. We had, in order to make it easier for these people to do our race, uh, we had funds donated by civic groups to cover their costs. When seeking potential sponsoring partners for our race, we recruited large local organizations with name recognition in the community that also provided services that paralleled CMH. A national partner for us was Promenica Health Systems, which is our hospital. Additionally, they are a sole resource for inpatient mental health care in our county. I had a contact with Promenica Board, and he got me a sit down with the CEO. Chromatic agreed to become a co-sponsor event, and they gave us $3,500, which was our race budget. So right then, we were in the black. Um, they also provided ambulance for us and the first aid station. Chromatic then in turn helped us get family medical involved. They're at, they're at FQHC, and they became our second partner. They donated, I think it was $1,500. So all of a sudden, we're, in the, we're way in the black. 
I'm proud to say that for our event, this is the first time either organization is involved in a 5K. And all the funds were needed to have a successful event, even more important for CMH is the opportunity to open channels of communication between our organizations and further establish our relationships and become more visible in the community. Prior to the race, many people only thought of CMH as a service provider for people with limited income resources. When we joined forces with the Gold Star Healthcare Provider of Southeast Michigan, you helped change the perception of CMH and that of overall, overall poor services to some, someone who has a more overall grasp of the community. We also reached out to the city um, in order to have a strong event. We were downtown, and uh, I went to school with the mayor's son, so that helped. So he got sent out with the mayor's son, I am the mayor. They came on board. They provided us all free of charge access to the building downtown. We closed off streets. We had police support. We had blockades. I met the city like at least once a month to talk about them. We had open communication. And it's interesting that the city they didn't even know where CMH was at the time. They said, Are you in the human services building? I think. <laughs> Said, yeah, yeah, we are. So they didn't know who we were. So this is another reason why we're raising our uh, awareness level. And I think it's important because I think a lot of communities are struggling with heroin epidemics. We're, we are in our community too. And working together in the city now of heroin, now they know who we are, and we're going to have open communication with them. This is a couple of photos from the pavilion they let us use. We also had many local state victories in our race that felt important for them to know what we were, what we were doing. Uh, we reached out to the governor, we reached out to state representatives, congressmen. Uh, for the race, we had a state representative there, the mayor, city administrator, county commissioner, and two city commissioners. And that man right there is our judge. He wore a tuxedo jersey. So, I mean, we, were, we had a total buy-in from our community. And he basically led the runners around the 5, 5K route to keep people safe. I think one misnomer is people think, well, if you have a 5K, people are going to show up because it's a good cause. I, I know from all my races that people just don't show up. You need to go out and get the people through your men. So I made a point to reach out to different service clubs. I'm a member of a, our new Rotary Club. So I had access, I spoke at five different clubs for Rotary in our county. I also spoke at Civitan, I spoke at the Lions Club, I spoke at Kiwanis, I spoke at uh, Interclub Council, which is where every club is represented. And for every club I had to uh, find a contact, I had to make a PowerPoint, I had to give a speech, and this is a lot. I was, uh, I could never thought I could be doing this. I loved it, but it was very stressful to go for all these people you don't know and give a speech. I remember one important point was uh, I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I was just, I knew what I wanted to do with these clubs. And I had to go, to go speak to Civitan to their uh, executive board and ask for money. And uh, it was, I think it was like a 7 o'clock on a Monday. And I asked uh, Catherine, who was our I'll reach Horny at CMH, who's over there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I asked her, could you go with me? Because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like 7 o'clock at night. She lives in Ann Arbor an hour away. And she said, I, yeah, I can go. So she came with me, and I knew then that I had buy it from our community about health, that they were on board, they were going to help me out. We are in this together. But I could not, I needed that support from her. <laughs> So speaking of these clubs, not only benefit the race by creating buzz, but also put CMH in front of community leaders. By sharing my personal success story, I was able to educate them on CMH services and create a new channel for future conversations. The feedback was tremendous. I think we got over $3,000 from all these clubs and donations. And invariably, someone would come to me afterwards and say, you know, I know someone like you, or could you speak at my club, or can you come here and talk? It's, it's really rewarding. For the Kids Dash, we went, I had a connection with one of the principals of the elementary school. 
And we had a sign-up sheet all the school. Did you see the photo there? There were they had a tally where all the kids who signed up that school registered. That's our flyers here. We had trophies too for the kids. The leading school got a gold shoe. The second place got silver. The third got bronze shoe. That was all done free of charge by a donation by somebody. I thought Aura was successful. We wanted to promote TMH to be more public. So I reached out to our Health Beat, which is a quarterly magazine, and I got the cover. Um, I talked about my mental health, my physical health, and my journey. I also gave us a chance to talk about the race. And it gave me a chance about, again, to talk about CMH, being a success story, what CMH could do in our community. We were also in the Daily Telegram, which is our local paper, four times, I think, two front pages. Uh, we created a Facebook page. Uh, we have over 500 likes, I think. The city allowed us to use their Facebook page, which has 20,000 likes, so it's a little fair audience. Um, we also, if you see that upper right corner, that has a local alarm you at, and they put a race on their digital screen. I was a friend of mine from Rotary did that for us. I remember driving to town one day, and I just see that our race is on their screen, and that this is a buy in our community. We also got continued coverage from uh, online newspapers, too. And that's uh, one of our photos from the front page of the paper. Uh, we worked with local radio stations. We had 30-second uh, ads by consumers. We set up a community conversation that included mental health, that included myself, uh, representatives from the hospital and family medical center. We discussed various ways each organization was look, work, working toward destigmatizing mental health in the local area. We also talked about services provided, and I also did a radio, uh, oh yeah, a morning radio spot. Right there, that photo of me doing morning radio. That wasn't that bad. But what was bad was I was on TV. Somehow we reached, uh, we had people reach out to Toledo, Toledo, Toledo TV stations, and we got on TV. I'm going to see if I can play the video. I remember I was really nervous to be on TV, and we get there on Friday at 6 a.m., and it was Cat Adoption Week, so they had these kitties. So we got the little kitty. Then we feel no better. <laughs> Maybe it won't be playing. It was only about 30 seconds. Um, I also finally talk about my event that it's more important. Anybody technology friendly? Yes. 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 
Yeah. I think I violated his rules. <laughs> Here comes a hero. Oh, I think we're good to go. There we go. Thank <laughs> you. 